So I wanted to start um, by acknowledging that there's no way I'm gonna really do a critical decolonized pedagogy and a revisioning, um, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna attempt to do some of it. And I'm doing it through a trifecta with a goal of having us consider what it would be like to seek ancestral connection in our teaching and learning. So I'm gonna do that through um, looking at our ACRL frameworks, which I will explain, Centa Pensante Pedagogy, which is new for me and I'm excited about it, but also like I'm happy to hear critiques. And then um, really bring that to a question of decolonizing our syllabus, which will hopefully get us to that central place of ancestral connection. Oh boy, it's happening. There we go. So the Association of College and Research Libraries is a national, oh, that was what I was gonna say. Now we'll start with ACRL frameworks. Um, and I'm gonna start with the ACRL frameworks by describing them as uh, the Association of College and Research Libraries. Um, it's a national institution that is li what librarians technically join. They just have their an annual conference online, um, which is exciting. And within the ACRL, uh, they've created a framework for information literacy for higher education. And it was adopted in 2016. And I can't not talk about ACRL frameworks if I'm going to be a librarian here talking to you. So you're welcome. Um, the, these pixelated slides are coming from the creators of the framework, uh, two of the co-chairs, Jacobson and Gibson. So I'm going to share the slides at the end, and then you'll be able to um, click on that link if you would like to on your own. In the creation of the frameworks, a new definition of information literacy was adopted, and that was that information literacy is a set of integrated abilities encompassing the reflective discovery of information. Also, uh, the understanding of how information is produced and valued, and the use of information in creating knowledge and participating ethically in communities of learning. And don't worry, I'm not going to read all the slides that I show you, but I might do that sometimes. The way that they see that uh, these frameworks can happen is through something called threshold concepts, which is a passage through a portal or a gateway. And that's where it captured me and where I became interested in learning the ACRL frameworks, because it was about gaining a new view of a subject landscape. And it really spoke to the movement through a liminal space, a rites of passage. You're speaking my language when you say things like rites of passage. And so that liminal space is something that is supposed to be what a novice or beginner or initiate, uh, if you will, goes through or travels through. And I definitely um, use a metaphor for Yoruba culture, for example, where you have to learn something, you have to become an initiate, you have to go through a kind of ritual that is confusing and, and leads you to a form of anxiety to get through this transformative space, this new space. So to summarize, I think that the liminal space is challenging, unsettling, disturbing, and it can often be where a student may become stuck. And in fact, uh, Hofer, Townsend, Hannock, and Brunetti in a 2016 article identified threshold concepts and information literacy as transformative, integrative, irreversible, bounded, and troublesome. And so if you were to think of how this works for you in other playing fields, if you were thinking of the disciplines in geology, the scale of geologic time is a threshold concept. In economics, it's opportunity cost. In accounting, it's depreciation. And so in what I study, rhetoric studies, writing, it's about understanding audience, purpose, situated practice, or genre. And the ACRL sees that if we get students to a place of these uh, six frames that they will get through the portal, right? They will have experienced this rites of passage. And so the, the frames are that authority is constructed and contextual, information creation is a process, that information has value, that research is as inquiry, that scholarship is this conversation, and searching is strategic exploration. And I decided to introduce us to a GIF for the librarians in the room who are just like, don't teach me about the ACRL frameworks now, give you something good to look at so that you can experience the portal with, alongside all of the rest of us. 
It's the feeling of discomfort, the moment of receiving new knowledge for which knowledge, for which learning is possible that I want to um, bring us to this pronouncement of affect, of this, this sort of feeling, the experience of troublesomeness, of worrisomeness, unsettling, disturbing, stuckness in the classroom and whether we want to get students to that place, whether we want to be in that place and whether we are up to that. It's this idea of affect that I want us to think about. The six frames um, have knowledge practices and dispositions that draw significantly on a concept of meta literacy, which offers a renewed vision of information literacy as a sort of overarching set of abilities where students are consumers and creators of information, and they can also participate successfully in collaborative spaces. So meta literacy actually demands behavioral, affective, cognitive, and metacognitive engagement with the information ecosystem. So when I think of meta literacy, I also think of its special focus on metacognition or self-reflection um, as crucial to becoming more self-directed in sort of a rapidly uh, changing information ecosystem. And so with that, I, I have to bring myself to engagement. I think that there's really no way to get students through this portal if they're not entangled, if they are not engaged. And if we look to the OED, engagement is the act of being entangled. It is attachment, possession, a moral or legal obligation. It's a formal promise, agreement, or undertaking. And in swordsmanship, engagement is the action of crossing swords. And if you've ever seen me present, I always use these same photos. So you're welcome. My very favorite is uh, Nandipa Mtambo, who's an artist uh, who works, whose work plays with dualities. And she uses these bull creatures that merge with the human form as contrasting figures that don't often coexist. And I really appreciate the confrontational image of Europa because it's to me what it looks like. It embodies an imagery of the affect that that liminal space can, can elicit. What happens when we investigate head on the role of the classroom and its practices of engagement, participatory learning, and apply a kind of critical information literacy alongside it? She calls it a strange friction. Her bull creatures teach us that the politics of representing other people is complex and it can create a strange friction and that this representation can be the case when we are aiming to reach out to students and actively engage from their experience, pushing them to depths of their own comfort or for our own, our own discomfort or their own discomfort. Um, and that the friction may occur um, when we feel. So if students are not feeling then they are not learning. Affect is real, the tension is raw, and quite possibly we are coexisting in a liminal space. And so I want us to think through how we get from a classroom to an ancestral connection and why are we reaching to our ancestors to begin with? What does our ancestral connection got to do with learning? And how does the liminal state take us there? So if that's it's obvious to me because I've been experiencing liminality um, and ancestral connections simultaneously. But for us to get there from a theoretical standpoint, I wanted to introduce us to Laura Rendon, who talks about Santa Pensante pedagogy. Santa Pensante is sensing thinking pedagogy. And Rendon aims to bring us to a wholeness of ourselves and learners. We are all one uh, in the space of the classroom. We can move beyond space and time to get to a place of knowing. She focuses on harmony, social justice, liberation, awaken inner, awakening of inner wisdom, promotion of reflexivity, connecting learners to their inner wisdom. And then she wants to center wholeness and non-duality. And, the, and though these may seem like buzzwords, meaning that it's, words that we throw around and it means something different to everyone, right? Like it might even feel a little woo. I think that in some ways that's the point and that it ought to because to enter into a pedagogical realm that is multicultural and humanistic in nature, one that reflects 
all ways of accessing and knowing truth. Uh, one that relates to multiple ways of knowing, that rejects one-sided perspectives, um, that falls into a new plane of knowledge creation. I think that we need to have it touch each of us differently. And so just like there are six frames of the ACRL frameworks, oh, and I actually put the feminist and masculine in quotes because that's part of the language that Rendon uses to acknowledge that it's faulty, right? Like I wouldn't put those two as, anyway. There's, I would love a reading group where we can go through Rendon's book and talk through it. Um, but I do like where she pulls from, she creates six dialectical spaces. And those dialectical spaces, uh, the same way that we have six frames, I see these six dialectical spaces as ones that we can sort of create a duality um, with while also moving away from duality. So hers are intuition, subject, contemplation, human community, humanisms, personal development outcomes. And she's, she sees them expressed as a diffrasismo where two concepts that are critically examined reveal how they differ and how they also complement each other and they can illuminate a larger reality. So if this feels too woo woo for you, I get it, except we have to consider what are the things that we already know. We have to acknowledge that we already have been indoctrinated and assimilated into a way of being, and that is the classroom. We as a culture and learned society walk with agreements. And so Rendon points out these agreements as those that privilege intellectual or rational knowing, separation, competition, perfection, monoculturalism, privilege outer work, and it voids self-examination. And so if we looked really briefly directly at separation, that we in the classroom have already signed on to the woo of faculty as the sole experts, the woo of keeping a distance between ourselves and our students, of, of linear learning, um, et cetera, et cetera. And so she actually proposes seven agreements of Santa Pensante where we can actually agree and instead to work with diverse ways of knowing in the classroom, to embrace interconnectedness, collaboration and transdisciplinarity, to engage diverse learning strategies, to be open and flexible. I see your hand, Melissa, and now it's gone. <laughs> um, to be grounded in knowing and not knowing, which is my favorite one. Um, the agreement of multiculturalism, balance of personal and professional lives, and taking time for self-reflexivity sort of a boundlessness is what we are agreeing to if we aim to dis sort of disavow the agreements that we've been told and that we've been taught and that we've been living. And I think that that is a really uh, important way to move toward a conversation of decolonization. Because in order to get us to a place where we can embrace a groundedness in knowing and not knowing, then it means that students are walking into the classroom already knowing some things, right? And we have to anchor what, where that knowing comes from. And I say that that knowing is something that is inside of their blood. It is something that they wake with in the morning, something that they are completely embodying at all times. And that it's our role as classroom facilitators to engage them with their own knowing. And to do that, I, rec I recommend not decolonizing our syllabi, but to decolonize our learning. And first I wanna acknowledge, oh, my slides in update, hold on, hold on. As it happens. Oh yeah, it did. I wanna acknowledge, I wanna see, so I just think this is my first one. I wanna acknowledge that decolonization is not a metaphor, that it's a real thing, it actually is an active thing and that it forces us to do a thing, right? It's not just a, a theoretic, it is an active word. And I like to think um, through how, do, and so actually you'll get these slides and you can click on the articles that help us to think through how decolonization could look in our classroom and in our universities. I like to pull from reparative justice as a model for how we can think through decolonization and that it seeks to provide a normative scheme for reparations, meaning we are in a position to politicize the world that we live in and that we can work in, within that politicization 
to deconstruct how we participate in the ecosystem of information. And I think that that looks very differently in many different uh, systems. Well, some ways to consider how we can um, acknowledge a reparative framework is through our role as educators, as faculty, as learners, as people who take money and spend it, right? Clearly articulate how outside communities coexist with us in our movements through the space. Um, a really simple example or one that comes to mind in that is when I was at CUNY and uh, Jesse Daniels had her large scale MOOC and she got like $500,000 from Ford. And what did she do? She did pay a designer. She paid people to put you know, videos together and she made sure she went to the communities that she was referring to. And she paid the folks like from the projects, people who were active organizers on the ground money to teach the classes, right? And then circulated those classes. So how do we work with outside communities to, re to redistribute, right? The resources that is very also simply articulated with OER, but now I'm just sort of going off, off of my slides. So I'm gonna keep talking. Um, considering structures and systems of power is how we can answer those questions of what it looks like and how power imbalances do harm and to whom and really just ultimately always focusing on reparations or reparative work. And reparative work to me also happens in the classroom when you in some ways ignite a student to have them evoke their own knowing. But I'm not really good at defining de decolonization. Um, I would leave it to the experts. And so recently there was a really great um, webinar um, with the I IRDL um, had a series, a speaker series, and Dr. Talbert was able to give us a uh, feminist indigenous approach to her research, speaking as faith. But if you click the clip and start it at 1447, she'll slap you really quickly with understanding how decolonization is not a metaphor. And then you can take it from there because you'll be inspired. I also think of uh, Clelia Rodriguez, who talks through decolonization through her book, Decolonizing Academia, Poverty, Oppression, and Pain. She gives tangible examples of how uh, decolonization can look within the classroom. And we actually brought her into CUNY in 2018 to keynote um, an open pedagogy symposium. And one of the things she says is that you are responsible for your own unlearning. She learned from her father, her grandfather, and her relationship with the land how it requires us to let go of deadlines, time, scholarly notions of productivity, and the feeling to compete for grades. The readings that often stay lingering around our heart are those that are not often published. She also published the shithole syllabus, the hashtag shithole syllabus, where she um, acknowledges that you don't get to possess students um, and that students don't get to possess readings um, and that there is an encouragement instead for us when we're creating syllabi to stare at a blank page instead and begin the course with that. It's a lifelong unlearning project nourished by the sacred beauty of questions, deep reflection and undoing. The work of undoing of redistribution is really the work of how decolonization can be active in learning and active in the classroom. Lastly, Rodriguez asked us when we participated with her, when we sort of asked her, what does this look like? She asked us to look to our natural resources, look to the ground, look to the land, look to the earth, look to the ancestors. And one activity that we did was we actually used dirt, salt, sugar, um, and coffee beans. And this, the people in the room, uh, some of the people in the room are on this call because I saw a couple of names in the chat, um, put their hands into the dirt, into the salt, into the sugar, smelt it, saw the texture, saw that we chose colors that were not standard colors, pink sugar, brown sugar, or pink salt, brown sugar. Um, and I've done this other times, brown rice, what's the difference between brown rice and white rice? What are the political implications of this? What do you already know about these objects, right? And then how can you create that as a starting point to move through a lesson on globalization or a lesson on Shakespeare, right? Like when, how do you transition that knowledge? And so we were able to construct syllabi using these natural resources. And I'm totally um, going to 
far over my time. So I did want to think of sugar um, by reaching to Kara Walker's Sugar Baby or an homage to the unpaid and overworked artisans who refine our sweet tastes from the cane fields to the kitchens of the new world on the occasion of the demolition of the Domino Sugar Plant or also known as a subtlety. To subtly uh, point to how the things that we know can be projected at scale. It can be a small bowl of sugar or it can be one that sits among an entire corpus of people. Emily couldn't be here today, but I did want to quote her because she um, helped the library community to learn about critical librarianship, which is really pulls from critical race theory. And critical race theory does things to us, like teaches us that racism is uh, normative, right? That it's not, it's that racism um, uh, is, is one that people benefit from. And so therefore there is no incentive to eradicate it. The tenets of critical race theory, I think when you apply it to librarianship and when you apply it to learning is that it does the same things as reparative justice, that it responds to our systems of power and it acknowledges the political context that are ingrained in the work that we do. And so if you are sitting at a dining table, I hope that they're all drinking bitter tea and wanting so badly to add sugar to it in this room as a form of learning. Um, and I was gonna talk about intersectionality, but instead I wanted to just give a couple of examples of what um, this could look like in the classroom. And so I love pulling from Samuel Delaney's um, uh, intention of asking students to raise their hand at every moment. Um, and that if they, if they don't have the answer, they can still raise their hand because they have to learn that when they don't participate and when they don't engage and when they're not asking a question that they're learning something also. And so it's, it's about the activity, the discomfort of raising your hand every time a question is raised. Um, even if you have nothing to say, that discomfort, that is part of the activation of liminality. I didn't mean for that to happen. <laughs> I'm gonna go to the last part, part that I wanted to share. And then I wanted everybody to, I wanted to share the slides with you. Um, I asked my students to go ahead and tell me what they see as um, ways to integrate the seven agreements of Santa Pensante. And so I've done this a couple of times. And so I've just sort of compiled a few responses of what it could look like, right? Like, how do we do this? Because I find people are really down for the cause, but people don't know how to implement it. And so um, some ways uh, have been outlined by students on how they imagine that Santa Pisante could uh, exist in their classroom, specifically if it were in library, library and reference instruction. I also asked them to tell me how, what they would stop. What are the things that you don't wanna see anymore to really engage in a critical pedagogy? And so students said things like, no tests, stop silence, right? What would you start? What is this, is this a stop start? Um, sorry, start, yes. Um, and then also what would you keep? What are things that you really like? And so I wanted to ask you to participate in that same activity. So I'm going to share the slide deck and then ask you to consider what would a classroom experience look like for you if you were to engage in a critical decolonized space. And one way to think that through is thinking through your own connection to your ancestors and thinking through what it is you already know. And um, a friend of mine who interviewed a few women of color for turning 30 for their Saturn return, we were interviewing queer women of color. And our key question was, how do you know what you know? Like, what is your favorite color? How do you know that? Like, if there, is there something that you walk with that you, are, you know is, is right no matter what? And that that's where you start the connection and you move through that. So I'm gonna share the slides and allow folks to, jump in, but I also realized I went way over my time. Um, and so I wanted to give Veronica a chance to jump in. 
Thanks, Sean. I actually think that's a really exciting activity. So if you want to share it in the in the chat and you can give folks a few minutes just to. Yeah, let's try it. There are the, there's the slide, Jack, and you have, if you just scroll all the way to slide 43, <laughs> you can start um, identifying two ways that you can imagine the seven agreements. And I should, I'm going to get rid of where it says practice in library and reference instruction service and just say in practice in the classroom. Because I would love to just continue to gather these ideas, right? Because I think we, I, I of course want you to have the deck so you can have the other ideas that people put in. Um, but I also want you to share ideas with each other and really think it through. And so I broke it down with the seven agreements that Rendon provides us as what does it look like to have respect for diverse cultures and multiculturalism in the classroom. And then if you're, if you're not sure, then you can broaden and say, what does it look like? To, what do you want to do away with? Um, what do you want to start doing? And what do you want to keep doing in the classroom? And I think we've been answering this a lot with um, being remote, right? Like we had to re reconceptualize how the classroom works for us and what, what things work and what things don't work. And um, it's a really good time to sort of undo all of the layering and start really fresh from scratch, which, you know, if there's, there's any time is a good time, but we can use this as an excuse to be the right time. So I'm seeing some people fill, fill in the blanks um, and I'm seeing that people are saying uh, no penalties for late work, accepting contradiction, incorporating meditation, five minutes. And two people put that and I bet they didn't even know that they were both saying it. So it's, there's some pluralities happening, shared pauses. creative expression, listening deeply. And what's great is, you know, nobody had to read Santa Pensante or Rodriguez or Tuck and Yang. You, you already have these answers, right? And that's part of the, the magic of this work is that when, we're, when we keep it at that place of liminality, when we are little Nas X spinning down a pole with our heels on, we know exactly where we're going. We, and we know what it feels like to be in that space and to get there. And I really like that we started with the seven agreements because I think that those things easily fit into um, the stop, start, keep. So thank you everybody for participating in that project. And I hope you look to see what others are writing and just like the, the, there's some more boxes, fill them in. And I look forward to us um, talking more at the end about new ways of learning and teaching. And thanks, Veronica, for the extra time. <laughs> Thank you, Sean. <laughs> um, I love seeing this process of people collaborating on the doc. It's really lovely. I know. Keep the slides inside it later. <laughs> <laughs> All right, is it OK to switch gears now, Elvis? Definitely, yeah. Excellent. Uh, thanks, Sean, for that wonderful presentation. I feel like I was just taking notes throughout the whole thing and definitely signed me up for that like reading group that you want to create around that book and ordering it today. Um, let's see, I am going to share my screen and switch gears a bit. Okay, 
everyone see my slides? Yep. Yes. Okay. Perfect. Um, so we're going to kind of switch gears a bit, moving from Sean's discussion about threshold concepts and critical information literacy um, and senti pensante pedagogy to thinking kind of more broadly about the critical classroom and what that might mean. And in conversations for today's presentations, discussions, learning together, I was sort of struggling to figure out where, where I had something to say about critical pedagogy, about the critical classroom. And it was really in conversation with Sean and Elvis and with um, Emily Dravinsky, who couldn't be here today, that we came to this idea of trust, right? So um, in thinking about and transforming our teaching along the lines of the kind of critical, feminist, engaged pedagogies that we're all aspiring towards, um, there is a pretty marked shift towards decentralizing the authority of the teacher, right? Um, in favor of creating kind of co-learning, peer learning, um, a more humanistic educational exchange. Um, and I sort of find that idea of decentralizing authority to be an interesting one. And we'll change names, like instead of a teacher, I'm a co-learner. Instead of a teacher, I'm a facilitator. Um, but I almost find this idea, right, of decentralizing authority as kind of a euphemistic one. Uh, because what we're really talking about when we talk about decentralizing authority is power. Um, and I really wish Emily were here because she always has a lot to say about power and academia, power and teaching. Um, but when we talk about decentralizing authority, we're talking about sharing power, giving away power, empowering others. Um, it all kind of has to do with where you see yourself in power structures and how much power you believe you have. So you know, as much as we want to enact an engaged pedagogy that focuses on whole people and transformative learning, there is an assumption that we're making. And that assumption is that we as teachers, as instructors, that we have power in the first place. Uh, so that's kind of our uh, working assumption one. And the second assumption that we kind of work with as we talk about critical pedagogy is that the only difference between the teacher and the student is our either perceived or performed positional authority and that we can easily dismantle and give away power through vulnerability, right? Or like well thought out class activities. Suddenly we can create a more interactive, engaged um, classroom. And I think what's kind of underlying those assumptions is that constructs of power in education are kind of easy to dismantle, right? But in reality, that system of education is large, it's bureaucratic, and it wants to keep power where it currently lives, right? It's that kind of systems theory, like systems exist to re replicate themselves. Um, and so many times the attempts that we might make at engaged critical classrooms are met by resistance, um, either by the students in the classroom, by our peers, by other teachers. You know, teachers may, sometimes we actually sabotage ourselves, right? We might introduce more critical content, but not change the structure of the class or vice versa. So that the actual structure of the class is still um, very hierarchical, despite the kind of critical content that you're bringing in. Um, other times, students or learners might be resistant to new classroom structures and ways of learning, um, particularly if they are used to a particular way that teaching and learning looks and feels. And I, I think that's where that, that idea of senti pensante pedagogy really kind of resonates. Like, you're used to learning happening in a different, in a particular way. And when it's different, um, it's worrisome, right? It's uncomfortable, you know? And 
you know, students might also be resistant to new ways of learning if an instructor holds a minoritized or marginalized identity, right? Suddenly they're asking um, why these changes are being made. And administrators and systems might squash attempts at chaining learning environments in favor of things like learning analytics and proctoring software and that kind of idea of, well, this is how we've always taught and this is how people learn without kind of taking the time to think about how learning could happen differently. Um, so today my focus is really on the classroom itself, whether virtual, in person, within academia, outside of it, within a library, outside of it, um, the classroom can be a multitude of things. I really wanna focus on teachers and learners and what's needed to dismantle the power structures within that relationship. And that's not to say that the kind of larger administrative piece isn't important. You know, it's a very critical part of the education that we're talking about, but that's kind of its own presentation. <laughs> um, so we'll get there eventually. Um, and I, I think that by focusing on the teacher learner relationship, and I, I really do wanna stress that it is a relationship that we can start to create change in the spaces where we possess a measure of power to actually create change. Um, and I think that to create the kinds of engaged critical pedagogies and classrooms that we want, we really need to look at the concept and the way that we enact and embody not just power, um, but the idea of trust. Just making sure my slides are moving along. Um, so I would argue that what the critical classroom needs most is trust and genuine connection which is difficult to create and is super fragile once you actually have it, it's really easy to break. Um, so what we'll do today in a large part of my presentation is really a discussion. So what we'll do today in talking with one another um, is to look at the importance of trust, right? At different levels and um, in different situations. And we'll look at the importance of trust in critical classrooms but we'll also look at the ways in which difference, right? So race, ethnicity, class, gender, among so many other ways in which we're all different from one another. Um, I wanna look at the ways in which those differences complicate critical pedagogies and complicate trust, um, because I think it's important to talk about those. So I'll do some talking, you'll do some talking, and we'll hopefully come to a shared understanding about critical pedagogy and the ways in which it kind of interplays with power and trust. So my, um, my images are not as exciting as Sean's, but we'll, we'll work with what we got. <laughs> um, so I think that moving towards critical decolonized pedagogy takes time. Right, we don't enter the classroom one day and declare ourselves like a critical pedagogy. Like we have, we have achieved it. We have gotten there. Um, it's not something that we can do alone. You know, learning and especially the kind of engaged, student-centered, and connected learning we aspire to achieve is a relationship between ourselves and the learners, between the learners themselves. Um, between the librarian and the faculty member, if you're a librarian, which is what I am. So there's um, kind of a double relationship I have in a learning environment between the instructor of record and the students as well. Um, and for that relationship to be meaningful and for learning to happen, there needs to be a basic sense of mutuality. Um, and what I mean when I say mutuality is this idea of respect for one another as a whole human being, right? Respect for another's humanity and seeing that person as whole and complete. And this idea is one that Bell Hooks emphasizes over and over again in Teaching to Transgress and her concept of engaged pedagogy. Um, and to Hooks, engaged pedagogy does not seek to simply empower students. 
Any classroom that employs a holistic model of learning will also be a place where teachers grow and are empowered by the process. Right? So that's where you see that kind of mutuality in action. Um, the kind of teaching we aspire to is one that's holistic and empowering for teachers and learners and concerned with all of our well being. Um, and this form of pedagogy sees value in all of us as, as people. But with that in mind, I also want us to remember that learning is scary. Um, not knowing answers is scary. I always think about my son who's nine, um, who will sit at a computer with his hands on the keys and nod along to his teacher and not be doing anything because he's scared to, you know, raise his hand and ask a question. It's it's a extremely vulnerable act to seek help, um, to try and understand something. And I, I take a lot of comfort in the centrality of relationships and connectedness that are emphasized in this idea that comes out of therapeutic models called relational cultural theory. And one of the writers um, and kind of originators of this theory, Judith B. Jordan, writes that we feel most vulnerable when we let people directly know about our need. And so if we, we think about that vulnerability and what we kind of need in that time, you know, she really advocates for a model of what she calls supported, ooh, supported vulnerability, um, which moves us away from this kind of illusion of like independent, sort of solo, self-sufficient person, and that's, you know, denying any kind of vulnerability. And it's towards this idea of relational mutuality. We need one another, particularly in times when we're learning. Um, and you know, Jordan continues to state that acknowledging vulnerability is possible only if we feel we can reach out for support. And to do so, we must feel some confidence in the relationship. And that phrase, confidence in the relationship, is what she defines as trust. Um, so this was a really roundabout <laughs> way for me to like frame, um, but also define our conversation about trust in the critical classroom, um, that emphasis on relationship, that emphasis on exchange. And to kick off our discussion, I want to share a quote from Technologies of Meta-Learning, Trust and Power. It's an interview with Jesse Stommel, um, and it's a, who's an educator and a blog post on the, um, I always pronounce this incorrectly, is it Haystack, H-A-S-T-A-C website? And um, it's a part of their, they have a whole series on trust, which is really fascinating. Um, so Jesse Stommel states that learning is always a risk. It means quite literally opening ourselves to new ideas, new ways of thinking. It means challenging ourselves to engage the world differently. It means taking a leap, which is always done better from a sturdy foundation. This foundation depends on trust. Trust that the ground will not give way beneath us. Trust for teachers and trust for our fellow learners in a learning community. Um, and I, I really, really like this quote, um, particularly that piece that trust that the ground will not give way beneath us because it can feel um, that extreme or that scary to engage in an act of learning. Um, and I, I was able to attend Digital Pedagogy Lab, which takes place every summer and which um, Jesse facilitates. If you ever have a chance to go, it's a fantastic learning experience. Um, and one of, the, one of the first things I'm sure Jesse would say and what we, kind of talked about in Digital Pedagogy Lab is that, you know, as a, as a white cis man, his identity impacts the way that he experiences and enacts trust and needs trust and the kind of trust that's automatically given to him. And so as I was reading this quote, um, I kind of came up with our first discussion question, 
which is what kind of trust do you need and want in the classroom? And why is it necessary to you? Um, it's going to be different for all of us. You know, for me, I have to trust that both the students and I have some level of curiosity in learning and in what we're talking about today, because, you know, if not, what, what am I doing here? What are we all doing here? Um, I want to trust that students and instructors see me as a person worthy of respect, just as they're worthy of respect. Um, so that's the kind of trust that I need. And I learned that we can't unmute ourselves or like people can't unmute themselves. But I would like to encourage you to answer this question in the chat if you can. And then also, because I like to do things on the fly, uh, I <laughs> created this Google Jamboard that you can all leave your responses on. So I will put a link to that in the chat. And you can kind of move forward from there. Okay. Veronica, I wanted to point out that um, sometimes I think Jamboard has a cap at like 25. Oh, does it really? Okay. Yeah, I'm just not going to go in. Cool. <laughs> <laughs> First 25 um, people get to go in there. But also, I think we undid the people can't talk. People can unmute people themselves. People can't talk? Yeah. Okay. Well, I will give you multiple modes of expression. So you can leave a chat message, you can unmute yourself, you can post in the Jamboard. You might need to show people how to use it. Um, <laughs> you can, can everyone see the Jamboard now? I can see it, yeah. Okay, great. So um, you can leave a sticky note and leave your response that way. Um, or you can just create a text box with your, um, with your answer. Or if you want to get real fancy, you can draw it out. <laughs> Okay, so we've got some discussion about supportive and respectful language in response to all comments. And I see various anonymous animals getting ready to post. Is this something needed to be clicked to post? That's a good question. Yeah, Joel, yeah. can you show how to do a sticky note again? Sure. Um, yeah, that seems to work. Oh, that's yeah. Handy. So a sticky note, and then you can just save, and that should that should save it there for you. Oh, so how do we get our own stickies? Right over on the left hand side, there's a little little icon for a sticky. By the end of this, we'll all be Jamboard experts. Um, yeah, these look great. And Sean, I appreciate your comment in the chat about bringing in your personal needs without seeming weak or unprepared. That's always one of my biggest fears as, a, as an instructor is to seem unprepared, uh, but it's it's almost impossible to be fully prepared for every scenario in a classroom. Okay, as folks are posting, and just in the interest of time, I'm going to kind of move on to the next question here. Um, so as folks are posting about the kind of trust that they want in the classroom that they hope to cultivate, um, how do we build that trust, right? I think there's often this tendency to lean really heavily on vulnerability 
right? The idea that like, I will do something and then I will ask students to do it. I will disclose and then ask others to disclose. Um, if I do it, other people will follow. And I was in a professional development course on critical pedagogy a few years ago. And the instructor asked everyone in the room to share a time that they had felt vulnerable while teaching. And, you know, of course they shared first with the expectation that they would do what they then asked others to do. Um, but this was the first time that any of us in the course had met one another. We didn't know each other. Um, I felt really uncomfortable being asked to disclose that vulnerability and so did other people. Um, some people just kind of gave like a sweeping platitude. I think I said something like, well, I'm a librarian and every time I teach, there's another teacher in the classroom with me. So that's kind of vulnerable, right? You know, it was this sort of sweeping statement. Um, and some people did share personal anecdotes. And then there was one person for whom that question just triggered a really strong kind of trauma response. Um, and it was, you know, everything had to pause, but made sure this person was okay, was feeling okay in the space, you know, gave them some time to process. And what that moment really solidified for me was this idea that you can't um, force vulnerability, right? You can't perform vulnerability in hopes of eliciting the same response in others. And there should not be the expectation that you have to di disclose all of yourself as an educator in a space um, that, you know, has shown itself to be unsafe um, for certain certain folks, right? If you identify as Black, Indigenous, as a person of color, um, and students who fall into any kind of like marginalized or minoritized identity might feel the same way. Um, and sorry, I'm just kind of looking at the chat. Yeah, yeah, there are some folks here. Sometimes you might not not be into sharing. Elvis, I really like that question about being open to building trust together rather than just like kind of assuming that it's a given. Um, so trust is earned, right? Trust is built. Trust is um, about relational authenticity, which is not the same as whole self or total disclosure or total honesty. What it's really about is about a quality of presence, right? So it's about being engaged and responsive and open to um, learning from and with and through a relationship with someone else. And trust is not without boundaries, which are um, just as important to a relationship as openness. And again, this is where Judith Jordan, who I quoted earlier, has a really fantastic phrase and she describes boundary as a place of meeting, right? So boundaries aren't impermeable. Um, they are about privacy, about self-protection. It's a clarifying of everyone involved in a relationship and everyone involved in a learning experience. And at that boundary is where the people involved in learning meet and come together um, and have the opportunity to be changed by one another. So I just, I don't know, I like that idea of boundary. Um, and so in thinking about that, here's my kind of next question, which is how do you uh, cultivate trust and relational authenticity in learning environments? And kind of going hand in hand with that, what boundaries are important to you in a learning relationship? Um, so I will leave this up. You are welcome to leave your comment in the chat um, in the Jamboard, which I've just switched back to. If you click on this little carrot up here at the top, you'll see that um, that questions I've just asked are listed here and you can leave your responses here as well. That's a really beautiful quote, Elvis. Thank you, uh, the I'm sorry. I was trying to find a full piece of it online. But it seems yeah. 
Awesome. And it's it's that idea of possibility, right? You're sort of meeting at this boundary. What could what are the possibilities that could could happen when two people meet? Um, so just in the interest of time, because I know folks are are sort of having to leave, I'm gonna kind of leave this Jamboard up, know that it's here um, and that you can add to it. And I will put the link in chat one more time, but I'll kind of keep us, keep us moving. And I might skip a question or two. Okay. Um, so the other thing I wanted to touch on as we talk about trust in the classroom and trust in learning relationships is um, this idea of sites of disconnection or places where trust and mutuality break down. Because I think this is, um, maybe we've had this kind of experience in the critical classroom and it's made us kind of shy away from enacting those kinds of teaching, um, teaching processes again. And again, another relational cultural theorist, Maureen Walker talks about how culture itself can become an agent of disconnection and distortion. And she talks about this primarily as it relates to um, race and ethnicity um, and talks about how difference itself is not inherently bad, but it's when difference becomes stratified um, and when difference meets power and white patriarchal power structures that we start to feel disconnection in relationships um, and that we start to feel that disconnection in our learning environments. You know, we, um, we feel this really acutely in the learning environment, particularly when we are not at the top of the white patriarchal power structure. There is so much more about our positionality and our identity that influences trust and authority then, right? You know, it could be about our place within the academic hierarchy, right? Whether you're a librarian, an adjunct, a lecturer, a tenure track faculty member, um, it could be about our gender expression or our race or our ethnicity. All of these impact our um, perceived power, our relationship with power and our ability to connect or disconnect from, um, from learners and from one another. And um, that's one thing, I'll leave this question up and I'll probably skip the next one, but I'm, I'm really interested in hearing from you um, maybe some sites or moments of disconnection that you might have as an educator, either ones that you are perhaps worried about or ones that you've experienced. Um, I'll, I'll just kind of pause and see if there's, there's any, any comments that folks would like to leave in the chat. Or again, in the Jamboard. So there's a really interesting comment that was left here by a librarian who teaches one shots. And for those folks that aren't librarians here, those are the kind of guest lecture spots that we are brought into the classroom to teach. Um, so this idea that we are intruders, um, that you're kind of stepping into someone's educational space and someone else's educational relationship is one um, I can totally relate to. It's a moment where you feel disconnected and that you're maybe even furthering disconnection. Are there other sort of points of disconnection that you may have felt as, um, as an educator in the classroom? Can I jump in? Of course, always. Um, I was recently in a course with Sophia Lang and um, Jorge Macros, is that? No, McKnight. Jorge McKnight Lopez. Lopez. Yeah. yeah. I'm, I'm just gonna read it off of their new title that I hope everybody has already purchased. Um, 
And so they were teaching about critical race theory. And one thing that was really helpful um, in their style of teaching was that they sort of were, it was very simple for them to identify when they were summarizing and extrapolating and then when they were quoting the author. Um, and when they were quoting the author, they were asking us as the students, what is the author saying? What is our interpretation of the author? Mm. Not actually what is the author saying? So in terms of disconnection, I think what was really helpful was everyone recognizing their own authority in the conversation. And so there was sort of what we know and how we understand what we bring to the conversation, what they as instructors know and bring, and then what the author knows and brings. And then this fourth space of everyone's interpretation of everyone else's understanding. And that yeah. the bridge can only happen when you have formulated your own, right? Like, so just really contextualizing everyone's own um, understanding of the of the knowledge as it exists and so then the disconnection i think happens as a as an instructor when students need the instructor to know the thing mm -hmm. as opposed to, and i think what librarians have learned is that we're not here to learn to know the thing we're here to show you the thing and for you to interpret the thing right and so i think that that so that moment of disconnection as an educator is only when students come in with the expectation of the the library or the instructor knowing the thing yeah that gray area is really uncomfortable sometimes <laughs> especially especially for learners who are, are used to a particular style of classroom where they're kind of told what they're supposed to know and how they're supposed to learn it like not just like what they need to know but the way in which they're supposed to get there um and that's actually a really great transition point. Thanks, Sean. Because <laughs> um, I, I wanted us to think about the student perspective as well. Um, not just how kind of we experience trust as as teachers. And so um, from here to kind of introduce this idea, I wanted to pull from a conversation that Bell Hooks with, uh, has with another educator, Ron Scapp, in Teaching to Transgress, um, where they discuss the concept of liberatory education. And uh, Scapp counters with this idea, right, to acknowledge student responsibility for the learning process is to place it where it's least legitimate in their own eyes, which is a super depressing statement if you think about it too hard, which I've been thinking about it a lot. You know, when we try to change the classroom so that there is a sense of mutual responsibility for learning, students get scared that you are now not the captain working with them, but that you are after all just another crew member and not a reliable one at that. And that is something I myself have definitely experienced a version of this in the classroom. You know, I've, I've taught a whole lesson and had kind of group activity and discussion around what we're talking about when we talk about evaluating information sources. Like, what does that mean, right? What, why would you use a particular piece of information to meet a particular rhetorical need? And, you know, despite what I think is a, a fruitful class discussion, I've still had students ask at the end, you know, well, is this a good source to use? Is this okay? Is this credible? Can I use this? And I, I, in those moments, just really, I don't know, it's just a kind of a really down sort of sad moment because I realized that they have this really strong lack of trust in their own judgment. Um, and I don't know where that fear comes from, if it comes from just like years of an educational system that's taught them that what they know is not correct or that what they know has to be replaced with something better, right? And so is it is it that fear of rejection? Is it a lack of trust in us? Um, I've also had students sometimes express that they're afraid that we'll change the rules on them at the last minute. And I have to wonder what's happened, um, what's happened in their, their educational lives that makes them sort of not trust themselves as creators and not trust their own voice as having something worth creating and sharing with others. Um, 
yeah, it's, it's just a really, a really tough, tough thing to go through. Oh, and I see Peggy's comment about fear of rejection, fear of being wrong is really prevalent in the math classroom. Yeah, my, my husband's a math professor and the amount of math anxiety and fear that is present is mind boggling. It's, um, it's really strong. Um, so as you kind of think about your own teaching, as you start to plan for classes during the summer, during the spring, for what's um, left of the spring semester, maybe even for the fall, um, I want us to think about how in a critical pedagogy classroom, we can help facilitate students' trust in themselves and in their own work. Think about what might complicate that um, and what are some ways that we can kind of facilitate this trust, not just in ourselves and in our relationship with them, but in, in their own work and their, um, their own sense of self as a creator. And so my hope is that our discussion today kind of helps us think about trust in learning spaces, in our classrooms, what makes it happen, what causes disconnection, and what keeps power in the hands of people who have it. And as we explore um, power, we need to explore trust and understand that vulnerability isn't the right answer to everything all the time, that trust is a complex relational act and that the more we talk about it and examine it, the better we'll be able to kind of cultivate that trust um, with the people who we teach, with the people who learn with us um, and with our peers. So I just kind of want us to inch towards that trust um, as teachers. And I will, I will pause there. Thank you so much, Veronica. Um, that was really lovely. And I agree with Sean, this slides are very calming. and. Um, just really um, offers a really lovely framework. And I think builds on what kind of Sean was laying the groundwork with certain concepts, but I feel like I almost felt the concepts, you know, sort of coming to life in these spaces. Um, so I just really appreciate that. And um, yeah, just the concept of liminality coming into contact with trust, I think creates something that's quite rare almost, you know, trust is not necessarily a given, but it can be created. And I think that is something really positive. Um, for us all, all to end on. Um, but yeah, thank you so much for being here. And do either of you have any last thoughts or closing comments or anything? Right. Well, um, <laughs> with that, oh, Sean, yeah. I was just gonna say thanks everybody for coming and it's always an honor to work with the graduate center librarians and the Open Pedagogy Fellows and Veronica, um, just great company. Yeah, I really appreciated sharing space with, with everyone today. Um, it was always, always great to share space with Sean and Elvis too. Absolutely. Um, well, very much likewise. And thank you everyone. And thank you so much for your kind comments in the chat. We really appreciate them. And I'll share the chat um, with Sean and Veronica afterwards. They can get a sense. Um, but yeah, I hope everyone takes away something really palpable from today. And we look forward to seeing you soon. So thank you again. Thank you back for now.